Joanne. final Miami University 2012-2013 lecture series. Tonight we have the opportunity to hear from an extraordinary gentleman who many consider to be the top researcher in his field and one of the most recognized people in astrophysics. Dr. Tyson began his quest to educate the public on scientific phenomena in his high school years where he served as editor-in-chief of his school's physical science journal. Perhaps most well-known, besides his taste for fine wine and writing instruments, is his work hosting the NOVA television series, which focused to educate the public in scientific topics in ways that everyone can understand. Dr. Tyson has also made numerous great discoveries and received many venerable awards over the course of his career. He was the front runner in the effort to have Pluto denounce as a planet and even removed it from the Hayden Planetarium before it was widely accepted by the scientific community. <laughs> presidential advisor, has an asteroid named after him, was honored with the NASA Distinguished Public Service Medal, holds honorable degrees from no less than 10 universities and colleges, and even made the discovery that John Stewart's globe on The Daily Show does, in fact, spin in the wrong direction. <laughs> in addition, People Magazine even named him the sexiest astrophysicist alive. <laughs> Just a side note before turning over the stage, if anyone wants to tweet about tonight's event, please use hashtag NDTMiami so that we can get a collection of everything. And in addition, afterwards there's going to be a reception with photo opportunities and some food in the Gross Center, which is directly over here. We'll take them over right afterwards and you can form a line at the door. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Hang on. 
just because there's a big basketball game tonight and we're like a basketball arena. So I just had this thought earlier today and it has nothing to do with the talk. So the dunk in basketball, which is the opposite of a three-pointer, should really count for only one point. <laughs> That's all. That's all. That's all. That's all. Often talks such as this are like uh, loosely veiled commercials you know, for somebody's book that they're trying to sell you. And this is no exception. I just thought I'd tell you. <laughs> no, actually, uh, the talk has nothing to do with anything I've ever written in a book. I don't like book talks because you could just read the book. What do you need me for? If I come and I'm here in the flesh, we should talk about something that doesn't appear in the books, okay? That's how, we, that's how I do that. Oh, I, do, I will call attention to this, just, there's some people who like mysteries, and this was a lecture series I gave, which is all about the stuff we don't know in the universe. So it's kind of easy, well, dark matter, we don't know. Dark energy, have no clue, <laughs> you know, just go on down the list. But you learn about the great mysteries and ignorances that we still retain in our advance of the cosmos. Now, I think uh, Pluto was mentioned in my introduction. I just thought I would just put that in there. Just, who here still feels for Pluto? That's a lot of them. You see, all y'all were in like third grade when this hit the news. So you must have been the ones who wrote me all the hate mail that got. It was you, Pluto. Just all I got Pluto had it coming. Pluto. You know our moon is five times the mass of Pluto? Our moon is five times the mass of Pluto. And Pluto is like half ice by volume. So you, you take Pluto to where Earth is right now, heat from the sun will evaporate the ice and it grows a tail. Now that's no kind of behavior for a planet. I'm thinking, you know, you see something with a tail, we have other words for those. They're called comets. Uh, so I, just to get Pluto out of the way, let me just show you. Uh, an, Amer an American discovered Pluto, but an American didn't name Pluto because in the 1920s there was a laxative called Pluto water that was for sale. And so uh, new planets to Americans were not associated with your bowels. So relief for constipation in 30 minutes to two hours. When nature won't, Pluto will, right? So that's just, so this got named by an 11-year-old girl in the UK. She had just learned her Roman gods. But I, I do have a folder of hate mail, and I think it was you guys. I'm pretty sure you were exactly the right age for when this happened. And here's one of those letters. This is a fourth grader, I'll read it to you, named Marilyn Trost. Uh, Madeline Trost. Dear scientist, okay, what do you call Pluto if it's not a planet anymore? If you make it a planet again, all the science books will be right. Do people live on Pluto? If there are people who live there, then they won't exist. So you just quite figured out how that works, you know? Why can't Pluto be a planet? If it's small, it doesn't mean it doesn't have to be a planet anymore. Some people like Pluto. If it doesn't exist, then they don't have a favorite planet. Please write back, but not in cursive, because I can't read in cursive. So people were feeling this, right? And even uh, comic illustrators got a hold of it, right? Isn't that sad? Poor Pluto. Like I said, he had it coming. Uh, I wasn't going to cover this next topic, but since, you know, there was a detonation 35, 30 times the power of the bomb over Hiroshima, I thought I might spend a few minutes talking about killer asteroids. And if there's time, we'll tell you about the ones headed our way. But that's just if it's time at the end, you know, during the question and answer period. I just, just want to get, before we really get into where we're going here, 
So here's a nice crater. Uh, this is uh, one of the two great holes in the ground in Arizona. Uh, the other one is the Grand Canyon. Visited both on the same trip when I was 14. And I got to the Grand Canyon, looked at it, and that's grand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I went to this, and this blew me away. You know why? Because I looked at the Grand Canyon and said, well, this took like millions of years to make, and this took seven seconds, all right? So, hell, I could dig this thing in a million years. <laughs> That's, give me a million years, I'll make a Grand Canyon too. But I can, uh, <laughs> in seven seconds, this crater is almost a mile across, and it can sink a 60-story building down in the center of the crater. So that was a bad day in the region. You didn't want to be around for that. And this is called Meteor Crater. In my field, we call it as we see them, right? Not like the chemists or the biologists or the, you know who you are, or the, or the geologists. The geologists, I've been signed a plant, a nice, pretty, shiny rock. Oh, look, a pretty rock. Oh, that's Walter Clay's Feldspar. Okay, I don't want the rock anymore. Excuse me. You know, and the biologists, what's the, like, what's the, the, the big molecule in the human body? What do they call it? Jack, yeah, right in the front row here, because front row people are smart people. That's how they work. Uh, deoxyribonucleic acid, he says with his arms folded. Okay, that took nine syllables to say, didn't it? Now, if you ask me what's the most important event in the universe, I would say, Big Bang! The, the formation of space, time, energy, matter. Big Bang! So I can get the whole universe done in two syllables. And you still require nine for your biology. So in my field, we just call it like it is. So if we find spots on the sun, they're sunspots, right? <laughs> so that's how that works. Are we together now? All right. We have easy vocabulary because the universe is complex enough. I don't want vocabulary getting in the way, right? As it does when you're trying to listen to a chemist, a biologist, or a geologist. That's all I got to say. And am I lying? Or any, raise your hand if you're a biology major, chemistry major. Am I, am I telling, I'm telling the truth? She agrees. <laughs> We're on it. Uh, by the way, we've been hit before. There you go, right there. <laughs> that one was 65 million years ago. That took out not only the dinosaurs, but 70% of all species of life on Earth. That asteroid is about the size of Mount Everest, about six miles across. You really didn't be, want to be around for that. That's when we learned that if you were where the thing hit, okay, you're toast, actually you're vapor, uh, but if you were somewhere else in the world, you also died. And that's where we learned that local <laughs> phenomenon had global consequences. And that was the, that was the sort of the modern, uh, the modern emergence of the consequences of local climactic forces affecting the globe. Right, and that was in the early 1980s. I, sh I showed this picture once to a high school, and someone in the front row, who you would think should be smart, said, oh, Dr. Tyson, is that an actual photograph? And I said, oh my God. I was ready to give up on the spot. And, and then I, they said, well, can I play with that? And I said, yes, it was. You know, and the pterodactyl had a digital camera, and we found that the SDI chip, and we put it, we put it. SD, SID, what do you call that? SD, the SD chip, thank you. The front row tells me. Back row, we'll give you a chance to say something here too. Uh, there's an asteroid that is about the size of the Rose Bowl. You ever see the Rose Bowl in Pasadena? Seats like 100,000 people. And there are no decks in it. That's one good reason why they call it a bowl. There's an asteroid that would fit neatly inside that bowl. And we discovered it now nine years ago in December, and we calculate the orbit only to learn that it intersects Earth's orbit. And we save certain uh, names for such asteroids. So this one we call Apophis, the Egyptian god of darkness and evil, right? <laughs> we save that name for it. Because had, had the asteroid not crossed Earth's orbit, we wouldn't have called it this. Call it like Tiffany or Bambi, you know, something non-threatening, right? 
asteroids named Tiffany, you don't even have to look up their orbit. You know they're not going to hurt you, all right? So Apophis, it's, it's going to come near us. It's the size of the Rose Bowl is going to come near us in uh, 2029, April. Almost exactly, you know, do the math, years from now. Uh, 2020, actually on April 13th. A Friday. Just, 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 just to, to disclosure here, just so you know. It's going to come close enough to us that it'll dip below our communication satellites. Now, it's one thing if you're going to come between us and the moon, then you're just sort of getting into your space, all right? You know, you know what that is, right? Because you can just, you know, you go up to somebody and you're like, right there, too close. Absolutely. <laughs> we are too close. So we got we and the moon, that's our family, and something comes right there, that's too close. This is going to come closer than that. It's going to come between us and our satellites. It's going to dip into our tech space. Now, I don't, I don't like that, all right? So, so their plan to, I guess I could take the steps next time. <laughs> so, there, there's a way, uh, there are currently plans on paper, I don't know if you guys can see this, if there's a way to deflect the asteroid. And you take this, this, a spaceship, maybe the size of this microphone, and if I'm the asteroid, about the right relative size, you bring it up and, and you, you park it near, this, near the asteroid. And you, you, they want to attract one another because they feel each other's mutual gravity. But you don't let that happen. As they drift towards one another, you fire retro rockets that prevent the spacecraft from falling to the asteroid prevents them from falling to one another. And the act of doing so slowly tugs the asteroid out of harm's way. You do this early enough, you'll miss Earth entirely. And so we know it'll miss Earth on April 13th, 2029. We're not so sure seven years later, April 13th, 2036. It's next pass by Earth. That April 13th is a Thursday. <laughs> Thursday the 13th. So, actually, this is a simulation. Let's see if, the, if, the, if it works. Does it? Yeah, here we go. So, if it hits in 2036, it will likely hit the Pacific Ocean, 500 kilometers due west of Santa Monica, California, and it will create a tsunami. Here we go, ready? Bam! Okay, so that's, the blue is bad, okay? So, <laughs> that's, so that's a tsunami that rises up on the shores of Santa Monica, 17 meters, which is about five-story building. And it'll basically wipe clean the entire west coast of North America. If it hits, if it hits us in 2036, it'll hit the Pacific Ocean. And, you know, what, what does that mean? All right, well, here it goes. It comes in, it's the size of the Rose Bowl, plunges into the ocean to a depth of three miles, explodes there, cavitating the ocean, that first impulse sends a tsunami five stories tall. <laughs> a water bottle fell. That's gravity. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> if the water bottle did this, I don't. That's a different universe, not ours. Right. So, so, so the, so the the tsunami wave comes, but then there is the matter of that hole in the ocean. It's a hole. So what happens to the hole? If you were a hole in the ocean, what would you do? You'd fill in, yeah, you'd fill in, thank you. I'm, I don't ask hard questions up here, please. <laughs> if there's a hole in the ocean, what would happen to you? Yeah, you fill, it would fill in. So the walls of water would slosh down into the center. It would splash against itself, rise high into the atmosphere, fall back then, down again, cavitating the water once more creating another tsunami wave. And this will happen about 40 times, okay? And so what that means is the first tsunami that's working its way to shore can only get so far because it, that water is necessary for the next tsunami, right? So these pulses of tsunami need each other's water. So you can calculate how far in it will go. It'll go about a quarter of a mile. And then it gets pulled out, 
Well, by the way, on its way in, it brought some coastal homes with it, right? And then it goes back out to sea, and then the next tsunami comes in and it brings the homes back in a slightly different shape, yeah? Okay. And so this is what happens. And so the, the, the materials of all these homes becomes an ablative force that churns the coastline. And it goes on for about 45 minutes. And there's, there's essentially nothing left, nothing human-made left along the entire coast. That's from Mexico all the way up to the base of the Aleutian Islands there. And so, so that's a, you don't, we, this happens, nobody has to die. We will know this in advance. You just evacuate the entire west coast of the North America. And then it was Los Angeles, San Francisco, and the like. But here's the thing, nobody has to die. And we calculate how far in it will go. Well, it's a, like I said, about a quarter of a mile. So you can set up like a velvet rope right? <laughs> and just you know, sit back, sell popcorn, and just watch this happen. All right? And then I, I thought this through and I realized that there actually two people will die. Two people. Two. Remember, this is California who we're talking about. Two people will die. First one. The stupid surfer, okay? The surfer. <laughs> Red man, I'm gonna, you know, that dead surfer, right? Fine. Actually, his surfboard will become an ablative force with everything else. His body is, human bodies tend to be squishy and don't make good ablative forces until the flesh is removed from your bones. Then the bones continue with the planks. I'm just saying, well, don't shoot the messenger here. The, the, other dead, the other dead person, the second dead person, is the stupid weatherman. You ever see these guys? The storm is coming in! Can you come a little closer with the camera? Dead person number two. That's it. That's it. Now, given what this, the magnitude of this, I think that's pretty, that we can live with that, I think. You know. Then there's another asteroid, and forgive me, I keep trying to get this video to work, but you've all seen it anyway, so I'll just mime it, okay? This is the front-facing camera over Russia, February 15th of this year, and it caught a 15-meter asteroid, 15 meters, so that's, you know, what is that? That's you know, the size of the sort of the seated area here. An asteroid that size, too small to catch it in advance. That's too small. All right, the ones we're worried about are way bigger than this. The kinds that would render us extinct. This one is just a bad day in your town, all right? So that one, that one collided with Earth over the town of Chelyabinsk in the Ural Mountains, Siberia, moving at 40,000 miles an hour. 40,000 miles an hour, that's like, 12 miles per second. And I can't seem to get this video, I'll try, I'll try it, but it's not, I, everything I try doesn't make it work. But you just look this up. Uh, yeah, that's not it. No, that's the next. Yeah, so, so it comes to the air, it gets, it gets bright, and then it goes, like that, okay? <laughs> See that? That's what it does, okay? <laughs> Right, right about over there. And so it, it gets about 30 times brighter than the sun. The sun. And there's every, as it explodes, and it was a mid-air blast, because if you're going 12 miles per second, our atmosphere looks like a brick wall to you. You explode in our atmosphere, you never even make it to the ground. So there you come and you explode, and everyone looks out there, they're, they're in the kitchen, wherever they are, and bright light comes through the window. It's like a Steven Spielberg movie when the aliens come, right? It's a bright light coming through the window and everyone is curious. So they walk to the window. Now they didn't do the calculation that light travels faster than shock waves, okay? So they all just walk to the window. I wonder what that was. Bam! And they all got cut because the window shattered into their face. The shock wave from that explosion is time delayed from the explosion itself. The light would have been a silent moment, at which point I would have ducked. <laughs> this is the value of knowing physics when the next asteroid strikes, okay? Don't take much physics, 
just light travels faster than sound. Just start there, all right? And you'll have to use fewer band-aids. So that, so that meteor, what do I got here? So that meteor, uh, it collapsed wall shattered with a thousand people. It was like band-aid haven, right? And this, by the way, we think could happen maybe once a decade, once every 20 years or so. It was the power of 25 Hiroshima bombs. 25. We have ways to calculate that. Now, how come it didn't level the city? How come it didn't kill anyone? Because this exploded 20 miles up. Much higher than the Hiroshima bomb. And when you're that much higher, your blast wave dilutes as it moves through space. So that by the time it finally hits you, <laughs> I'm just messing with the camera here. That way people think he's trying to move, but I'm staying with him and he's not actually moving. It's the whole rest of the room is sliding past us, right? So, that's just relativity right there. <laughs> so, where was I before I distracted myself? What was I talking about? See, finally the back row is contributing, and you guys were like mute on this one. So the 20 miles up explodes 20 miles up and dilutes on its way to the ground. Had that exploded at the same altitude as the bomb in Hiroshima, no building would have been left standing, no human being would have survived, and in fact, any eyewitness would have just simply been dead. Probably multiple days would have gone by before anyone would have known anything because anyone who could have reported it would have died. That's a kind of an interesting state that we're not accustomed to thinking about. Well, I, my colleagues, have been talking about killer asteroids for decades. I'm in front of Congress. They say, we got killer asteroids. Worry about these things. No, we got problems here on Earth. <laughs> right, so the Russian asteroid hits. What happens? Within two weeks, Congress holds hearings on threats from space. So I'm a little disappointed that we are reactive to hazards rather than proactive, but I'll take it any way we can get it. My favorite comment on this subject, I don't know if you can read it, is a big one, one T-Rex speaking to another. All I'm saying is now is the time to develop the technology to deflect an asteroid. So had the dinosaurs power over such a technology, uh, they would surely still be here. Because they were around for a longer period of time than the time has, that has elapsed since they went extinct. So if you take away that dinosaur, this little extra time they've been around is not all that much compared to the time they've been around. So well, our mammal ancestors were scurrying underfoot, probably filling that belly there, right? Because we we were hors d'oeuvres for T-Rex back 65. Our mammal ancestors were hors d'oeuvres for T-Rex. So, of course, T-Rex could not build any technology because they didn't have opposable thumbs. <laughs> You'd kind of need that, you know, I think. And I, I tweeted this. I, I didn't come up with this poster, but it's, it's my favorite poster. Asteroids are nat nature's way of asking, how's that space program coming along? <laughs> Occasionally an asteroid comes by and you think it's going to hit, but then it doesn't when you get better calculations. All of that happened in 1998 in one news cycle. In other words, back then, before the internet, before Twitter, yes, there was a time before Twitter, we discovered an asteroid, the calculations showed that it might hit Earth. As the day went on, better data became available, and then we showed it wouldn't hit Earth. So there was a period of time where everyone was worried, and the New York Post, had a headline the next morning because we, by then we knew we would not get hit. That's my favorite headline ever on any topic. Ready? Kiss your asteroid goodbye. <laughs> the New York Post. Now, now just to put our priorities straight, uh, there was a headline above the banner at the top, and it was a comment on Leonardo DiCaprio's latest movie. Okay, Leonardo's stinker. So, so the editors are saying, well, the world might have ended, but we have to tell people about Leonardo DiCaprio's movie. So these kinds of, I'm told there's journalism school here, right? 
So, or, or major, so just keep this in mind, that there are journalists out there who do this sort of thing, right? Putting movie reviews above the end of the world. <laughs> and then in there, they, they interviewed like college students of what they would do if the next day the world was gonna end. And this was interesting. <laughs> okay, so, Brad Clever, college student. I'd probably go to church, then I'd get drunk. <laughs> I'd spend all the money I have on women and alcohol. I'd fly to the Bahamas and sit on the beach with a tequila until the asteroid hit. Brad Clemmer, age 19. Okay. Elizabeth Pena, so a research assistant, so she's no longer in school. I'd get married immediately, since I'm going to get married later this year anyway. And we'd forget about the honeymoon. We'd just start getting loaded right after the wedding. So this juxtaposition of church and alcohol is a repeating theme for people who know the world is going to end the next day. Then we get over here, Pete Kalabiska, age 19, college student. I'd get together with all my friends and my family and have a big farewell party where we'd all get drunk. And I'd go on a date with Cindy Crawford. No, he's not. No, no, no. I think that one will happen for him. <laughs> so here's the problem. <laughs> None of them said I would try to find a way to deflect it. <laughs> Say, you want a few more of those kind of people in your culture <laughs> who see a problem and try to fix it rather than to just consume alcohol. <laughs> What's that doing there again? Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of things, but just so I want to show of hands, who here was dragged here and had no idea like who I am or what I'd be talking about, but you just dragged here. Raise your hand. We've got a few draggers here. Okay. Let's all welcome them. Okay. Thank you for coming. <laughs> are not majors in any subject remotely related to science. Raise your hand. Cool! Okay! Excellent! And how many science folks are here? Okay, science folks are louder than liberal arts folks, apparently. <laughs> and a little bit less melodic, I would notice. Uh, I just want to show you a few things. You just bear with me. A few things I just want to show you what's cool. This is, you might remember, the, of course, the periodic table of elements. Some people are shaking by seeing this. <laughs> but you never see this again, huh, after high school. It's all the elements. Oh, fine. I have a cool program where I can color code what these boxes are doing. They're color coded as they are, but in no way that is of any particular interest at the moment. I'm going to color code them by melting point, so let's go ahead and do that. And so the deeper is the red of the element, the higher the melting point. And notice there's a cluster right down there in the, in the middle. Uh, so there's wolfram and rhenium and osmium and iridium and hafnium. These are the elements that melt at the highest temperature, among the highest temperatures on the chart. Thomas Edison spent years tinkering with elements on the table to see what would not melt as a filament in his bulb in his Edison light bulb. If he had this software, he just, oh, let's go straight to tungsten, which is W right there. That has like one of the highest melting points of them all. A curious anomaly here is carbon. Carbon has the highest melting point in the form of diamond. Very hard to melt diamond. So that's one way. Another way I can have like discovery here. So let's go back. Uh, this is 1669 and everything in gray, nobody's discovered yet. Everything in blue, everyone has known since the ancients. So some of these elements you've read about, like in Homer or in, you know, so there's iron and carbon and copper and silver and gold and lead and antimony and arsenic, sulfur. You've heard all of these. Some of these are even mentioned in the Bible, right? So, so these go way back. As I move the time forward, uh, what did I put the next year at? There it is. Uh, now this is now, at 1776, the year our country asserted that it was free from England, but did not yet make that happen. 
No other country celebrates that occasion. <laughs> Think about it. Every other country's Independence Day is when they actually achieved independence. We would still have a war, we'd have to write our constitution, we didn't have a head yet. So if we use the date that would correspond with every other country's independence date, it would be sometime in 1789, like when George Washington took office. Then you have the birth of a country and the constitution is ratified. So we declare just by saying so, we are free from England. Right? So that's take some you know, kahunas, you know, to some gonads, right? That's the gender neutral way to say that. So you know. <laughs> I think, right? I think so. <laughs> Plus it's, you know, it's sufficiently erudite that you gotta let that one in, right? You gotta like all right, so we have the gonads to say we are free just because we signed this piece of paper, so or a piece of parchment. So, all right, so a few more elements were added. We had hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, platinum, nickel, zinc, cobalt, manganese. Uh, let's keep going forward. I just point to all this, by the way, so just chill out for a minute. Uh, this is 1869, 10 years after Darwin's Origin of the Species. Many, many more elements are discovered. Uh, way down here, this heavy one, 92, uranium, discovered 1789. Uh, that was a few years after the first planet was ever discovered. We've known about Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn since forever, because they're bright enough for the unaided eye to see. No one is credited for discovering them. Herschel, William Herschel, by accident, discovers a new planet. He is working under the payroll of King George, George III, the George of our Declaration of Independence, right? The George presiding over England when we said we are free. So he did what any good scientist would do and named the planet after the thunder. No one had discovered a planet before, so the nomenclature for them had not yet been established. So for about a 20 year period, the solar system was Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, George. <laughs> so I have books capturing this. It's called the Georgian Star. And clear heads would prevail. But you don't want to piss off the British because they're the most powerful country in the world. So you got to throw them a bone somehow. So the moons of Uranus, unlike the moons of other planets, themselves named after Greek characters in the life of the Greek god after whom the Roman god was named. Right, you got that? So in other words, Jupiter, one of Jupiter's moons is Ganymede, the manservant of Zeus. Zeus is the counterpart, the Greek counterpart to Jupiter. So you got that? That way there's an homage to Roman history and Greek history. Uranus is the one exception. We don't want to piss off the British. Moons are named after Shakespearean characters. Fictional Shakespeare, so there's Portia and, and Puck, Oberon. If you know your Shakespeare, these are major characters. Some minor character, and we have one Shakespeare literate person <laughs> right up there. Shakespeare people in the audience? Okay, we're up to eight. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so that's, that's uranium. Oh, by the way, the element right next to it, so uranium is named after planet Uranus. It's named for it. And then when Neptune was discovered, they saved that next element for it. Neptunium. <laughs> Neptunium. And then 1940, we discovered another element, one notch up from Neptunium, 10 years after the cosmic object known as Pluto was discovered. And what do we name? Plutonium. So Pluto has an element named after it on false pretense. <laughs> I feel like taking like, you know, just a, 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 an eraser, you know, just. <laughs> By the way, plutonium is discovered in 1940. Five years later, we would isolate it, manufacture it in the lab, and create a bomb out of it and use that bomb to drop over Nagasaki. That's why the government paid physicists to do their work in the 20th century. 
It's not because we really wanted to explore. It's because physicists are experts in matter, motion, and energy. And war is about taking energy from here and putting it over there. That's all that war is when you think about it. I got energy here, I'm gonna put it over there. No, maybe to the left a little more. How about a little higher, a little lower? That's all that war is when it's actually underway. So here's something, something perhaps sobering. Half of this talk is gonna be sobering, I think. Not that you are currently drunk, but it's gonna be sobering. The next is a map, put the flag of who discovered the country on the element, and let's see what it looks like. There you have it. Take a look at the bottom, the heavy end of the periodic table. Good old American flag right there. So we discovered Neptunium, Plutonium. And because we discovered these, these elements, we get to name them. You get naming rights. So after Plutonium is Americium, named after America. <laughs> Americium is an active ingredient in smoke detectors. CM, we have, we, have, um, we have Californium and Berkelium, and we get to name this stuff after ourselves. Take a look at the right-hand column. I don't know if you can see it in the back row. There's the Union Jack there, good old flag of the UK. And that's helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. England discovered every one of those elements. Now, chemists in the audience, what do we call that right-hand lane? The noble gases, those are all gases. Do you know why they're called noble gases? You just were, you're just repeating this because your chemistry teacher told you that that's what they're called. Have you ever stopped and wondered why they're called noble gases? I will tell you why. Because the outer electron orbital of those elements is full. It cannot bind with any other element, so they stand alone on the periodic table. They don't interact with anybody else like the noble class in England. <laughs> the Brits named this. And I'm reminded why, among other reasons, we fought a war to get the hell out of England. Because that's the way they think about the world. So their caste system is layered on our elements. Piss me off. <laughs> right. By the way, the noble class interacts with itself and not anyone else, but none of these elements interact with each other. So they're really uh, uh, social misfits on the periodic table if you really analyzed it all the way through. Now, here we are in America, and I'd say, well, how much science is done here? But I see, keep hearing about science elsewhere. Get a little bit of science envy here. How about CERN? CERN, this is a big particle accelerator in Switzerland. They're making big time discoveries there. Discoveries we could have made 30 years ago. We had the superconducting super collider being built in Texas. Started in the 1980s. All right? They started digging the hole. A collider three times the power, three times the power of the Large Hadron Collider, which is part of CERN. Oh, by the way, CERN, that's the, uh, if you, in English, it's the European Center for Nuclear Research. But I'm told that in French, you would say it in the order of those letters. So Center European Research Nuclear. Something like that. No, I don't know how, I, that was probably awful, but that's what, I'm told that's how that goes in French, so that's how you get that word. Our, we, our collider is three times the power of this. We would have found the God particle, the Higgs boson, that's been in all the news in this past year. The particle that grants mass to other particles. That's a pretty, if you have to be a particle, that's the one to be. Because you wait around, you, uh, thou shalt have this much mass, and you have more and you have less. But you walk around the universe, you know? You are the Higgs boson. So, uh, my favorite joke from a friend of mine, his handle is Science Comedian on Twitter. Uh, he, he does science jokes. Yes, there are comedians who do science jokes. And so, one of them is, the Higgs boson walks into a church and the priest says, 
sorry, we don't allow Higgs bosons into churches. He says, you have to, otherwise you can't have mass. <laughs> Uh, so we would have had this. We would have had this back in the early 1990s. But Congress completely cut the budget. Well, by the way, physicists named named our collider the superconducting super collider. And I'm thinking, did you have a few more words available to you? <laughs> Put an astronomer on that. We would have called it the super duper collider. Right? <laughs> then maybe they would have funded the whole thing. But the funding was cut in the early 90s citing cost overruns and Texas was getting too much money. And I'm thinking that's not really the reason. You know the reason? Something amazing happened in 1989. Peace broke out in Europe. Peace broke out in a war that had been the driving force of all the particle research that had gone on the entire century. So all of a sudden, Congress judges that we don't need the science because we didn't need the war anymore. So, so let's keep going. You have other countries out there. Uh, China, I've heard so much about China. Just to get the numbers on the table, if you took the smartest 25%, the top quartile of Chinese people, in any metric that you come up with, pick an exam and they take things and get the top quarter. Anything, it doesn't matter. The smartest one fourth of Chinese outnumbers the entire population of the United States. Just, I'm just saying. So, so, so that's how the, the, their population is so large that those kinds of numbers apply. And in China, they're building the Three Gorges Dam, six times the power of the Hoover Dam. We haven't been to the Hoover Dam. You look at this thing, how did this even happen? China is six times bigger. And China is no stranger to big projects, right? They built the wall. Now, if you pick the wall, the wall just keeps going to, to the disappears into the horizon on each side of you. Right? China is no stranger to construction projects. They have a burgeoning space industry. Russia. Russia. There we go. <laughs> Russia. Do you know Russia decided that they want to fund a mission to deflect Apophis? And they said, who's with us? And we said, yeah, okay, we're with you. And I said, wait a minute, pause. I, I'm not used to this. Russia is going to deflect Apophis and we're just kind of, we're, can we go? <laughs> what the country is this? Why aren't we funding that? It's going to affect our surfers, okay? <laughs> not, not Russia's surfers. So, one of, it's the beginning of this one early signs that it, we're, we're not walking towards a cliff. It's we're, we're fading, and as you fade, you become less relevant to world affairs. People no longer reference you for decisions they make. They no longer include you as a first thought, maybe as an afterthought. Definitely not as a first thought. And how about Brazil? If I just say Brazil to you, What's the first thing you think of? Soccer, well, rainforest. A barely clothed people on the beach with, with bikini tom, what do you call the thing that goes up your thong? Thong or tom? Oh, well, tongs are what are, sorry. <laughs> I get my H's. Thongs are what you like serve. Okay, salad, yeah. Like the shoe, like the shoe thongs, because it's just the thing that goes through the thing. Right. So, <laughs> so thongs. Uh, what, what else? So we think of, we think of all this. All right. This is American hubris. Love that word, hubris. The notion that we have a little more importance in the world than we actually do. It works nationally. It works regionally. It works um, locally. It works to the individual. Here's an example of hubris. I, I love, who doesn't love a good book of optical illusions? Right? We all love optical illusions. And that's what those books are typically called, optical illusions. What they should be called is brain failures. Because that's what is happening when you're looking at the picture. Oh my gosh, is it in the page? Out of page? Is the stick longer than the other stick? I can't figure it out. <laughs> optical illusions. That's what that is. You don't call it that because that would 
not be good for us. And anytime we, we well, I'll save that for later. Hold on. So Brazil has an aerospace industry that employs 18,000 people. It is the third largest aerospace industry in the world. Brazil. 90% of the jets you take between regional cities are on a jet designed, built, and manufactured in Brazil. They don't make a big deal of it because they know, as Americans, we're thinking bikinis, soccer, and rainforest, not aerospace engineering. If you walked up to the plane and said, made in Brazil, as Americans, how, how would you feel about that? Would you like not go on and you'd say, Brazil, they don't know nothing about aerospace. But they do. The third largest industry in the world, it is $20 billion, and they design an airplane that can run off of pure alcohol. I know there's some surprises in the audience because you'd rather drink the alcohol here in America, right? Did not even occur to you to make a plane that runs on alcohol? The good thing about alcohol is that it's renewable, right? It's, alcohol is essentially solar power. Now the science pride, uh, I have a collection, you know Europe has gone to the euro, the euro, the one currency except for England. And I, I think we've lost a little something there because back when each country had its own money, they, who, they, yes, you occasionally put a head of state on it, but also there would be like, important people in their cultures and in their societies. And it included scientists. So I have here, this is from my own collection, I, I you know, copied money from all these various countries. And there's like famous scientists on these money. And you, you're reminded that they did important things. That's Nikolai Tesla from uh, Yugoslavia, now of course not a country anymore by that name. That's Nikolai Tesla, Copernicus. Poland, right in the middle of the important guy, put the sun back in the middle of the known universe. I have a Marconi here who's, who was father of radio communication, uh, uh, communicating by radio waves. We have Alexandra Volta, also from Italy. Volta, his man got a unit of electricity named after him. The Volt, not, not the car, okay? but the electromotive force known as Volt. The dude in the middle left is Antoine Sténa-Chupéry, not a scientist, but an aviator. And he wrote the book, The Little Prince. And that's an image of the little prince on the money there. The Little Prince, uh, if, you, if you look for ways to deflect asteroids, there's a, there's a website called b612.org. And they're trying to garner, and, and, um, effort from around the country internationally to deflect asteroids. B612 is the name of the asteroid that the little prince landed on. Isn't that cute? <laughs> That's all. Flip the currency over, what do you get? You get like lightning discharges up there with Tesla. Tesla was an awesome experimenter with electricity. You get this rendering of a solar system with the, the known universe with the sun in the middle. A little too much freedom from the artist, but that's okay. In that case, we have radio towers here, we got the aviator plane, and the Little Prince reprises on the back. We can go to Romania, that's two sides shown together. Romania had a total solar eclipse across their country, and they were so enchanted by it that they said, let's put that on the money. So there's a track across the money there, where, which was the eclipse. And then they gave the other, the flip side, the artist, I don't know what they were doing, there's a big blob, pink blob, purple blob, looks like an alien coming into the solar system. So uh, once again, the artist had a little too much freedom on that image, but nonetheless, it's inspired by the universe. And down here, of course, in England, Charles Darwin, of course, looking old there, but in fact, Charles Darwin did his greatest work before he turned 26. So if they were to show him because of his scientific work, they should show him as a dashing young man. But no, his with the beard gives him gravitas. And uh, Charles Darwin worked on what bird? The finch, studying beaklet, and that is a hummingbird next to him. Okay, so the artist said, oh, it's a bird with a beak. Let's just stick that on there. Um, there is, 
it's not limited to Europe. We can go to the Middle East. That's a currency from Iraq. That's an Ibn al-Haytham from a thousand years ago. He, dis he discovered how sight works. Before him, people imagined that your eyes sent out a beam of light and illuminated what you were looking at. Right? And so eyes had this sort of light power, that they were active rather than passive. In there is uh, some iconography of his illustrations that shows how the eye would work. In the bottom one here, we have, I guess that's five shekels, I guess, from Israel with Albert Einstein, of course. Again, another gentleman who did his best work before he turned 26. That should be a dashing young man photo, and it's an old dude with wiry hair, because he lost his comb. Now, in this case, uh, Albert Einstein was not Israeli, but when you're smart, everybody wants to claim you, so they put him on the currency anyway. And there's more here. Look at what Europe is doing. We have Euler in the upper left, and Galileo, and, and Carl Friedrich Gauss from Germany. Galileo is, of course, Italian. And then we have Michael Faraday from England, invented modern uh, modern, a modern understanding of electricity and the generation of electricity comes from Michael Faraday. We got my man, Isaac Newton, in the middle left there. My man. <laughs> Smartest guy ever to walk the face of this earth. No rebuttals, good. Wise. <laughs> no one says, oh, how about Leonardo da Vinci? No, there's no contest here. I'm telling, don't get me even started. <laughs> don't. Okay. Down here we got we got uh, Louis Pasteur, so that's obviously French. Now, if I were to ask you, what country is best associated with excellence in engineering in the world? What country is the first one to come to your head? Germany, of course. German engineering is a selling point in TV commercials. German engineered car. German engineer. You never see something advertised as Polish engineering, you know? Maybe they have good engineers in Poland, and they just don't use it as a marketing plan, okay? So, what's going on in Germany that might have led to this, you might ask? It's in their culture. It's in, in, in the heritage. Let's take a look. There's the one note here from Germany with Gauss on it, in the middle right, and I zoom in, and I say, Wait a minute, what is that? Whoa, what? Whoa! It's a mathematical distribution function.